Hi everyone, welcome back to the Navigant Credit Union Broadcast Center. I'm Go Local News Editor Kate Nagel. It's a full lineup today of news and politics here in Providence, and there's nothing that's up more higher in the news right now than BRU being sold to K Rock. They're officially going to be making the switch over tomorrow. Again, this is the radio station affiliated with Brown. Did have the opportunity to reach out to someone who had penned sort of his thoughts, having been intimately involved with BRU, knowing sort of what's taken place. Tucker Hamilton, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Well, at moment's notice, you shared it with one of our colleagues here, and it was brought to our attention. So kind of soup to nuts, as you saw my introduction or heard. Um, you know, we're reporting on what's happened with BRU, but you have a unique vantage point that you really want to share what you saw transpire. And I just want you to share with us from, you know, we hear the news, but obviously there's a lot leading up to it. So let's start with your involvement with BRU and maybe bring us up to speed to where we are today. Uh, yeah. Um, so I just recently graduated from Brown um, in May 2017. Um, and I was a part of WBRU for all four years of my college career. Um, I started almost the very first week of my freshman fall, and I joined the production department. Um, so I produce a lot of the advertisements that go out on the air for mm -hmm. WBRU. Um, and then as an upperclassman, I took over imaging and branding, which is producing all of the original promotional content, um, audio, audio content that goes out on Uh, well, to backtrack, my very first station membership meeting involved two representatives from the professional WBRU board um, coming to us students and saying, you know, we're kind of in debt. We lose money every year. In four to five years, we may be looking at a bad situation if we don't change something. Okay. Uh, I thought that was amazing, you know, as a freshman coming into a potential sinking ship. Um, but for some reason, nothing changed. Um, for four years, everything kind of went according to plan. So that was four um, years ago that they had brought up that there might be financial difficulties. But then from your, from what you had seen, there really wasn't much heard from the board after that meeting. Uh, no. Okay. Um, especially since one of the big problems was that our sales staff um, was not meeting their quotas. Um, not just my time there, but um, the time before me. Mm -hmm. um, and no uh, conversations about potentially personnel changes or anything involving the infrastructure of WBRU. Were, they, um, were, until, this, were the sales uh, quotas? I mean, I didn't mean to interrupt, but were they were they widely ambitious? Was it how difficult was it for the sales reps to meet these? Um, you know, I think the quotas may have changed from back in WBRU's golden age. You know, at one point we were very, very successful at kind of the height of alternative rock. Mm. Um, we kind of were there when Nirvana broke, yeah. um, so that was a big deal with our success. Um, but the quotas were definitely not something that were outrageous. Um, okay. We just kind of had a sales staff that, um, and not blaming people, but may or may have not been, you know, on the right track. But it wasn't one year of falling off. It was almost a decade of falling off. Okay. So you had that meeting freshman year. Let's fast forward to when things you heard again that a sale was potentially on the table. Uh, yeah, so I didn't hold a, a director position with WBRU. I was involved in a lot with Brown, so I was just an employee who had my responsibilities. Um, but then at the end of the fall of my senior year, 2016 fall, um, all of a sudden people were saying that we were needing to take a vote whether or not to sale, sell. Um, our most valuable asset, which is the actual terrestrial signal. Mm -hmm. uh, that is 95.5. Um, and this was something that originally started at a vote on the professional board level. Okay. Um, they deliberated it amongst themselves as a, a board and then voted, and then the vote went through to bring the vote to us students. Um, and the student membership board ultimately has the power to make the big decisions because um, they run the commercial business. Um, so I was very shocked, especially since, you know, the sinking ship argument hadn't been brought up for years. There was always rumors of, you know, debt, especially from the glory days. Um, so I got very much more involved. Um, like I said, I wasn't a director, so I wasn't really a part of any of the initial conversations until they brought it to the student membership board about a vote. Um, and then uh, a committee was created to talk about financial options and a business consultant was hired and essentially a turnaround plan was created 
Uh, this turnaround plan consisted of Brown giving um, WBRU a line of credit, which they've done twice in the past already, okay. um, to help with our debt, as well as give us cushion to rebuild um, our profits. Um, and I think it was a five-year plan. It may have been less or more, I'm not quite sure. Um, but a lot of the students didn't like the turnaround plan. Um, uh, a lot of the students like the idea of starting something new um, and what really spurred that was that representatives from the board came to the students saying you're going to get a giant endowment of millions of dollars if you sell this signal mm -hmm. uh, $350,000 is going to be your initial gain from selling and we're going to give you this $350,000 to do whatever you want with Okay. Uh, which is something crazy to say to <laughs> Um, you know, we are very young, we don't have $350,000. So a lot of students um, who are either on the fence or who are thinking of a sale uh, were really motivated by the idea of having that hundreds of thousands of dollars to essentially uh, back startups. Um, you know, we had one alum and representative of the pro sale argument say you could have a start, you could finance three startups a semester, and ultimately, if you lose the $350,000, it won't matter. So what was your reaction when you heard that? Again, this would have been, you know, foregoing the 95.5 signal. What were the thoughts, again, if you didn't have 95.5, uh, you know, whether it's internet or other signals, what were the thoughts that you could do with that $350,000? Uh, yeah, so one of the meetings, uh, so we actually postponed the vote um, to create committees to kind of research what we could become if we weren't 95.5. Yep. Uh, and every department really came back with their own idea. Um, one of the things that the public is commonly, uh, they know right now is that um, WBRU wants to continue being a radio stream just digitally. Mm -hmm. uh, they're working on digital streams of current, um, their current programming. Mm -hmm. uh, News wants to do a podcast um, to expand their presence in WBRU. Um, people still want to promote um, concerts and mm -hmm. be involved with live music. Yep. Um, WBRU would be a, a concert promoter um, and, and as well as uh, producing uh, uh, digital content, media content. Okay. Um, and so every committee brought back an idea and what was interesting is that the higher ups both in the professional board and as student in the student board, the directors and GM and so on, all said great we'll do all of this. Um, so the plan was to do everything. So there's going to be four digital streams. There's going to be two podcasts. Somehow we're still going to have the connections to promote concerts. We're going to be a digital media content provider. Um, and this is when I started to get concerned um, just because my initial reaction was definitely do not sell the station. The station is something I've loved for four years. It's something that's inspired me to go into media production. Um, I don't want it to change. Um, and then I, I took a step back and I thought, well, I'm leaving. You know, maybe it should be something else to, you know, better provide to Brown students as well as the community. Mm -hmm. uh, money and to run with it and see if something sticks. Mm -hmm. uh, in my mind, in my opinion, it's very unorganized and unprofessional and WBRU's legacy is turning into a paycheck that will dwindle in very few years. So is that sort of one of your overarching concerns is that there's this initial influx of money to get these off and starting, but you're concerned about sustainability? Um, that was my initial concern. Um, I, didn't, I didn't promote the sale and I never changed my vote of the mm. sale uh, to be pro sale um, because I didn't believe in the new plan. I didn't think um, it was going to stick. Um, but then I became very concerned when the actual voting happened. Okay. Uh, we had uh, the initial vote and it turned out that not enough support was given to the sale. Um, the board needed two thirds majority to authorize the sale. Mm -hmm. um, the vote didn't give them that. And let's, uh, let's just break down the vote here for a minute because I know you talk about the professional board versus the student board. But what level was this that didn't occur, didn't reach the two thirds level? So um, I believe the two thirds rule applies to both boards, but right now I'm talking about the student board. Okay. And the student board are total, is completely um, consists of student employees and their vote is the one that matters. And how um, many members of the, uh, how many student board members are there? Uh, so during the vote, there was about 30. Okay. Uh, 
but actually there were supposed to be new station members added to the board after the fall of 2016. Um, usually directors, which are students, nominate underclassmen or new employees to be a part of the board so that we continually have fresh faces. Mm -hmm. uh, ever since the vote was brought to our attention, um, those rules were completely disregarded. So no new station members were added to the board, um, which heavily, um, heavily um, affected the vote. And so, um, you, yeah, let's talk about not reaching the two-thirds level, which you said was necessary to have the sale move forward. How did it ultimately transpire? Uh, yeah, so we had the vote, um, and the GM sent out a, an email directly after the vote um, that automatically had a biased tone. It said, you know, we were a handful of votes um, short of selling the signal, so now we're stuck. Um, because we didn't have enough people to uh, approve the sale, we're stuck in this quote-unquote limbo zone where we'll just keep bleeding money and we'll be essentially um, trapped in our debt. Um, which was not the plan, um, you know, if we didn't get the authorization to sell, there was talk of following a protocol to think of a better financial option. A lot of the students didn't like the original turnaround plan, so we were supposed to think of a better option. Um, and Tucker, when was this approximately that the two-thirds wasn't achieved, the GM stepped in and said, okay, time for plan B? When, when approximately was this? This was late April. Um, I don't want to say the exact date of April. I, I do know it, but I don't want to okay. say it and be wrong. Um, so this was late April, and in the GM's email, she said, all right, this didn't work. Um, we're going to take a revote. Um, so a revote was planned to happen three days after the original vote, um, and this statement was followed by a long email chain of confusion. One of the first emails was, one, your email completely just um, affected a second vote. You just painted a plan B and this limbo state so negatively, so a new vote is automatically going to be biased. Um, another person brought up the fact we weren't following the protocol, the protocol um, to start on a plan B, um, and a lot of students were very opposed to a second vote okay. um, because it didn't, seem, it didn't seem appropriate. It didn't even seem legal, frankly, um, but we were assured that it was legal. Um, but during the process, uh, or during the time between the first vote and the second vote, mm -hmm. which was three days, um, huge email chains of what I call coercion and bullying transpired, okay. um, in which two student members um, and student employees quit um, due to intimidation and bullying. Um, one student was criticized um, for speaking out against our GM, um, and he was called sexist and racist and a very long uh, email that was sent to all of the station members. It wasn't um, addressed uh, privately. Um, and that student felt attacked and humiliated, so he quit. He so let's feel... take a little step back here. This, this board member, this student, was accused of being sexist and racist. Who made those accusations? Um, so it originally started, this student was attacked, um, said that the GM, who is a uh, woman of color, um, that she was not following our protocol, she wasn't taking this uh, the appropriate route, and he didn't feel like this was appropriate or fair, so he was calling her out for doing this incorrectly, in his opinion. Okay. Uh, another student who was a, a male student of color, who is um, um, a part of the board as well, um, sent an email, a very long email, to the whole station membership e email chain, saying um, that your comments are fueled by sexism and racism. I can only uh, imagine that this just blew up. It did. Um, a lot, of, I believe, besides the retaliation from the attack student, another person said, this is uh, this is absolutely absurd. The fact that we're talking about a revote, the fact that this is transpiring this way is absolutely absurd, and it shouldn't be happening this way. Um, so, okay, so uh, you, know, you see resignations, a call for the second vote. What happened next? Um, so, uh, after a chain of kind of campaign messages saying this is why you should go pro sale, um, along with other students actually quitting um, because they felt uh, cornered, the second vote did happen. Um, we met three days later um, in a room to take uh, what I thought would be an anonymous vote, um, but an hour before we actually voted, another campaign of pro sale arguments happened. Um, at one point, the GM asked all those still in favor of keeping the station to raise their hand. 
Um, at this point, it was a very small group of us, um, and none of us actually raised our hand except for one person um, because it was, it was so humiliating. We, we saw what had happened on email chains. One, it was supposed to be anonymous, uh, an anonymous vote in the first place. Uh, so one person raised their hand, um, and then that person that was actually kind of targeted with more campaigning. Um, but essentially, the second vote happened, and immediately after, another email was sent by a GM, um, but it was very much uh, in a different tone. It was congratulatory. It was congratulations. You know, we've now it was 80. Um, it was or excuse me, not 80. It was like eight votes to 30 votes. Um, so now we got the authorization of sale. Thank you so much for your patience. Um, we'll start, you know, working on this new WBRU. And that email was then followed by another director saying, thanks for all your patience. Do not talk to the media whatsoever. Um, you're only allowed to talk to us um, directors and student members. If you have questions, please direct them to directors. Don't go to the media. Do you feel, uh, did you feel, obviously as a student, clearly you're an alumna at this point, what was the reaction amongst the student body? Did you did you feel threatened and clamped down on? Um, I, I mean, I was outraged from the first email that said we needed a revote because I, I didn't even think that was possible. Um, so I, I, I never even thought we would revote. Um, during the vote, I was completely mad, especially since we weren't even voting. People were still campaigning for pro sale. Um, so at one point I wanted to leave, just put a proxy vote in through, we had the option to do a proxy vote. I was just gonna put it on my email and then just leave. Mm. Um, so I was mad, a lot of people were mad, um, but a lot, of, a lot of people didn't speak out. Um, and I believe there were two reasons for that. One, um, I believe it was intimidation or certain voices in the past had been su suppressed. So a lot of people didn't feel um, they could speak out. Um, I guess there's a third option. A lot of us who were pro keep the station were about to graduate. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people said, you know what, this isn't my space anymore. I guess I have to give it up. Okay. They felt defeated, um, but they didn't feel like fighting. Um, and then uh, I guess the other reason was a lot of incentives actually came out of the, the revote. I believe a lot of people were kind of promised things um, that were granted now um, if they came to the pro sale side. I'm not saying the argument went direct, directly that way, you know, if you do this, we will give you this. Um, but a lot of people who were uh, pro keep the station are now authority figures in the new WBRU. So that happened, you were at the tail end of your uh, time at Brown. So what happened then? Did you just say, okay, I'm graduating, I'm moving on, I'm out working out in Colorado now. And then you see, obviously, did you know at that point, I mean, we just announced, obviously, the sale to Caleb. Um, when did you kind of put the pen to the paper and, and share this and say, hey, I really want the story to get out there? Uh, yeah, so initially, um, you know, I was I was very upset by how the, the revote happened. I didn't think it was fair. Um, but I was still trying to be supportive because uh, my ultimate goal was to have WBRU survive in some way. Mm. So I actually started trying to help um, the new WBRU. Um, and I actually just got done working for WBRU the entire summer. Okay. Um, so, and so even after graduation, I continued to do imaging work. I, I, I you know, put together all the promotions for the last summer concert series. Um, and I tried to help you know, do the imaging for the new digital streams. Um, but during that process, I was, you know, still in the station, and I just saw how unorganized and unplanned this idea was, um, because the whole argument for selling the station was you have all this money to run wild with, and now it's time to actually organize, and it just wasn't in the makings. You know, when it comes down to it, WBRU is run by students, not professionals. Um, and a lot of alum who are now big names in media production um, tried to help in certain ways, um, but a lot of voices who were originally um, anti-sale were actually disregarded. Um, so during the process of the summer, halfway through the summer, I realized this is, you know, this is absurd. Like the community has no idea this is happening for one thing, um, because no one, everything that was um, printed or put on the news was leaked. So nothing publicly was being brought to the attention of Providence who ultimately this sale is affecting. Um, so I was mad about that. You know, I inquired um, with alums about if there is anything I could do. 
Um, and essentially, I got in contact halfway through the summer with alums who were still trying to fight to keep the station. Um, and that's when I started um, preparing to go public with my story as well as help um, help the uh, anti-sale um, work efforts. Talk with us about the money side of things, if you will, for a moment. You know, you mentioned that the student body, the, the board of directors for BRU was promised $350,000. The sale was quite a bit more than that, was it not? <laughs> yes. Um, so, you know, I, don't, I wasn't actually part of the finance committee, and I, you know, never had anything to do with WBRU's finances. Um, I knew they were planning to get roughly around $5 million for the signal, um, and then that would come in the form of an endowment. And mm -hmm. the way it was presented to us was that that endowment was going to kick out an initial $350,000 okay. um, that we had the ability to um, use. Um, that was how it was presented. So it was really around, we know we're going to get millions of dollars that will be there, but right away we're going to get hundreds of thousands of dollars that we can use to our disposal. How big, I mean, you worked at BRU, you're a Brown alum, I mean, how much of your Brown identity, would you say, was sort of uh, filled by your participation at BRU? I mean, is, is, was that sort of a major focus of your four years at the school? I, I think it was a big deal for me just because I didn't come to Brown knowing anything about WBRU. Um, I kind of fell into WBRU because um, I thought the idea of being a DJ and a, a radio personality would be fun. Um, and then I ended up joining the production department. Um, and because of my audio editing and production experience at WBRU, I started looking into media production. And essentially, it helped me figure out what I wanted to focus on um, as a study at Brown, which is media production, as well as um, hobbies. I had three jobs with Brown that involved videography and audio editing. Um, and then now I'm trying to pursue media production. Um, but I think, it was, I, was, I think it was especially important for me because I, I came into Brown not a big uh, music aficionado. You know, uh, I started listening to more alternative because of WBRU. And the fact that I could feel uh, the magic of being close to large bands, being at concerts, promoting um, music the way WBRU does, it made me realize how special it was. And that was coming from someone who had no idea um, that it was. Um, this thing at Brown. So a couple more questions. I so appreciate your being able to take the time to Skype in, especially as again, we're right in the midst of it right now. We're here in downtown Providence. You know, you hear from those folks that say, well, radio and media is all going online uh, and, and, you know, stations and frequencies aren't going to be the way of the future. What do you say? I mean, is radio going online or can it be sustained at, at the frequency level? Uh, I believe right now, uh, Digital streaming is possible, but it's something that should be done in partnership with a station's original terrestrial signal, um, not in in, um, in place of it. Um, I've spoken to many WBRU alums who are still in radio who still believe this sentiment. They don't believe radio is dead. They have successful careers in radio, and they have seen radio stations leave their terrestrial signal, go to digital online streaming, and completely die out. Um, I've been told that stations believe, oh, our, all of our listeners mm. will switch immediately to our digital platform. They had thousands of followers, and the first week they had 12 listeners. Oh my goodness. Uh, it's, not, it's not there. It's not there yet. So. <laughs> so, you know, you gave us the full lowdown. You've been there from the vote to where we are today. I mean, you talk about the pressure being placed on the student board. You talk about the initial meeting four years ago about sort of the uh, financial situation, again, back when you were a freshman, what ultimately killed BRU? You know, frankly, I believe this started from the top down. I believe there are members on the professional board who don't want to be a radio station anymore. Um, I've been told by previous board members that there are people on the board who are, one, not involved in media ever or not involved anymore, and they're tired of WBRU, and they want it to be something different because they don't want to relinquish power. You're on a board of something huge, you'd rather change it than just leave. And so this is something that came from the professional adult board not wanting to run the station, um, and essentially that trickled down to the student membership. Um, there, there's been kind of a lack in motivation of 
sustaining WBRU, my time every year since I've been at Brown, because there's there's so much talk about radio's dead, we're losing listeners, we're losing money. So a lot of students who love radio and who have loved WBRU are thinking, why should I love this thing that's dying? Why should I love this thing that the professional board thinks is not worth it anymore? Um, the professional board's biggest argument is that we're doing this for the students. The students don't want to run the radio station. Um, and that's that's an absolute lie. There, there are plenty of students who want to run the station. I believe now that some of the larger authority figures at the station don't want the new WBRU, or excuse me, they don't want to run the radio station anymore. Um, but that's not, that doesn't speak for the whole station. And that, that definitely does not speak for the province community. So again, you brought this to light, reached out to some media. We were able to get you to Skype in. It's, here we are, you know, it's September. We're going to see the station change over. Did you just feel the story just needed to be told? Did you envision yourself when you started at BRU being involved in such a contentious combination of both your student life and the real world? No, I definitely did not see it as a freshman. Um, I definitely saw it as uh, extracurricular activity. Um, as I got older, I definitely valued it for its professional experience. Um, I know that what I've learned at WBRU can actually transfer to the real um, media pro production career field. Um, and the reason why I'm speaking out is for two reasons. One, I believe that whatever the community has been allowed to hear about this is very skewed. There's a whole part of this story that is not told. And my side is just one of it. Um, there are a lot of students I'm still talking to who have even more experiences that I had no idea were, were um, happening. Um, so I believe the, the student um, perspective is something that should be told the community to see what is really happening. Um, but also, you know, I realize I am kind of late telling my story, but it's because I've been working with a group to actually stop this sale. Um, at this very moment, me and certain representatives from the WBRU alum group are talking with the Attorney General to petition this sale. So you're, from a legal standpoint, are going to continue to move forward to contest this from what you said was what you view as a not legal uh, process being followed? Correct. Um, so my story adds to uh, a legal petition that we're hoping the Attorney General will take on um, to investigate um, the process of how this sale is going about, as well as whether it actually is legal for WBRU to sell their signal. Um, there are certain, I, you know, I don't want to get into the uh, legalities of it because I really don't understand it. I'm not the lawyer of the group, um, but essentially there are some uh, nonprofit benefits that WBRU gets. Um, that may make it actually illegal for them to sell their main assets. Um, but my story is supposed to encourage both the attorney general and the community, uh, the community members to uh, rally and help us with potentially saving WBRU. Well, Tucker, I appreciate your taking the time to Skype in to, to us here. Is this, is this sort of risky business ask? Is this sort of the biggest like life lesson coming out of Brown University? You know, you go to school, you go to class, but are sort of the lessons learned from this kind of moving forward sort of almost as, almost as big as the, the Ivy League education itself? Uh, yeah, I think, you know, I think this is something that Brown encourages. Um, you know, it does kind of look like I'm going against Brown students, which I totally am, but I'm also standing up for something I believe in, and that's something that Brown teaches you, as well as something that Brown students um, act upon every day. Um, this, this may be something that is um, close to home. It's a local, um, or it's a local conflict, um, but if it's something you believe is right, I, I think it's worth standing up for it. And I, I hope Providence think it's something um, worth standing up for as well. Well, I, again, appreciate your taking your time to Skype in to give us your perspective as folks continue to report on it, the local continues to report on it. We're right here in downtown Providence. Being able to Skype into you from Colorado, get your perspective. Tucker Hamilton, 2017 Brown graduate, BRU board member. Appreciate your Skyping in. I'm sure we'll be talking soon. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank okay, you. Okay, thanks. Tucker Hamilton, I'll let you